This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 119. Hi, I'm Kumanzi Constable, author of the best-selling book, Stop Chasing Influencers, The True Path to Building Your Business and Living Your Dream. This guy is in my dreams more times than I care to admit. It's my buddy, Jeff Brown, and the Read to Lead podcast. If we could all learn how to be ethically persuasive, most of the problems we experience in the world would vanish because we'd be better communicators and we would never be willing to make a sale at the expense of another person. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hello and welcome to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where each and every week we discuss not only leadership, but also related topics like personal development, productivity, career, business, marketing, and entrepreneurship. And in fact, it's marketing that's getting our focus today, as you and I will sit down in just a moment with Ray Edwards, author of How to Write Copy That Sells, the step-by-step system for more sales to more customers more often. I'm going to be asking Ray about why he believes a clear understanding of copywriting is so important, the difference between selling others what they want and selling them what they need, some of the secrets to writing great copy that can be derived from the movies, and much more. This episode of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you by Read to Lead University. If you're in the States and would like to be notified when Read to Lead University registration opens, just text the word university to 33444. Outside the U.S., just make sure you're on our mailing list or you can sign up at readtoleadpodcast.com. Ray Edwards is one of the world's highest paid copywriters and marketing and business coaches. In fact, he's had a hand in selling an estimated $100 million in products and services. Ray occasionally speaks at seminars on copywriting, promotions, and marketing for professionals in those fields, and he's appeared in magazines, newspapers, trade journals, and on national radio and TV. Ray has written several books, the latest of which is How to Write Copy That Sells, the step-by-step system for more sales to more customers more often. It has been a goal of mine since uh, I started this podcast to have Ray on the show, and I am excited that that day has finally come. Ray, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I love your podcast. It's one of my must-listen-to podcasts. And so it's been a goal of mine to be on. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. I I should say, too, you've been very generous uh, on your show and and in your blog to uh, occasionally reference uh, us. And that is very much appreciated. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to, to jump into this, this world of copywriting and have you to, so that all of us are on the, on the same page, uh, kind of define that for us and, and share why you believe this is so important for, for individuals and businesses to comprehend and understand. Well, the first thing to understand is that we're talking about writing words that persuade people. Mm-hmm. The, the quickest way to describe it is persuasion in print. Sometimes people get confused and they think that I'm talking about protecting their intellectual property. That's a different kind of copyright. (laughs) Spelled differently in everything. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) Uh, And so I think it's important because uh, first, it's obvious in business that we want to sell more of our products and services. So anything we can do to become more effective at the process of selling profitably, that makes sense to business people and entrepreneurs. But beyond just that segment of the population, Anybody who wants to persuade people, whether it's to buy something or whether it's to go on a date or Mm -hmm. pick a different house plan or eat at a certain restaurant, I think the understanding the principles of persuasion are really important. And, you know, we see examples of how to do this poorly all the time on Facebook as people are trying to convince us of their political and religious views. (laughs) And uh, they have trouble communicating in a way that evokes the desired response. (laughs) <laughs> you mentioned the word uh, persuasion, and I want to dig into that a little bit because the reality is not all copywriters are, are created equal. And what I appreciate about Ray and his work and the book is he goes out of his way to insist that uh, when practicing this these techniques that you're being truthful and honest. And I would love for you to talk, Ray, about the difference between 
uh, manipulation and persuasion. Sure. I, and I love to talk about that because I think it's misunderstood. Yeah. And once people do understand it, I believe most people want to walk in the light, which <laughs> is persuasion. And persuasion is convincing someone to do something that is in their best interest. And manipulation is convincing someone to do something that is in your best interest hmm. while disregarding their best interest. And so a huge part of it, this is where people get confused. A huge part of the difference between persuasion and manipulation is the internal motivation of the person hmm. attempting to persuade or manipulate. And it can look the same from the outside in many ways. But one way to know if you're being persuaded or manipulated is the difference between internal pressure and external pressure. And we all understand this. If you're talking to me, Jeff, about a book that you love and you're just being effusive about it and saying how wonderful it is and how I really should read this book, hmm. I begin to feel an internal pressure that says, mm, I want to read that book. Hmm. It's not that you're twisting my arm or trying to force me into reading the book or use guilt or embarrassment or shame to get me to read the book. You just have helped fan the flames of desire for the outcome that I believe reading the book will get me. So that's internal pressure. External pressure would be if you cornered me in front of a bunch of friends and said, this is a really fantastic book. All smart people have read this book. Have you read it, Ray? Would you like to? Well, now that feels like external pressure to me. And probably a better example would be if you're at a car lot and you're looking at cars and you get approached by the salesperson who puts their arm around you and suddenly they're your best friend in the world and they're inviting you to sit down in the car and you tell them that you're just looking and they say, well, what are you looking for? And you say, well, I'm looking for a red Camaro. And they said, well, if we had a red Camaro, would you buy it today? And that's <laughs> instantly you feel the external nature of that pressure and it feels bad. So probably the, the most succinct way to say this is that persuasion is something you do for someone. Manipulation is something you do to someone. Uh, I actually sold cars back in the day for about a year and a half. And one of the reasons I didn't do it for very long and, and didn't do it very well is because I was not comfortable with uh, what were oftentimes the, the tactics I was being taught uh, to use to be successful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, when I entered the uh, internet marketing space a few years ago, I began hearing this phrase, uh, sales letter, thrown a around a lot. This, this holdover, I think, from, from, from last century. Help us understand what this thing is, Ray, what it's designed to do, and give us some, some insight into to what makes for uh, an effective sales letter when we're, when we're marketing. Well, you're right. It's a holdover from the previous century. It came from the world of direct mail selling when the pioneers of that industry started sending letters in the mail that were designed to sell us things. And m many of us will remember the Columbia House Record Club <laughs> where you could send them a penny and they would send you 11 albums and then they would send you one every month and it was almost impossible to cancel. <laughs> I did that, yeah. So that was called a sales letter for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. And so when the World Wide Web came along, one of the early pioneers was a gentleman named Marlon Sanders. And he was the first person I saw do this. He actually made a web page that was essentially a sales letter from the direct mail world put online as one long scrolling web page. And as far as I know, he was the first person to do this. Maybe he wasn't, but as far as I know, he was. And it was incredibly effective, especially for the first couple of years, because nobody had ever seen this on the internet. Hmm. And it was the reasons it was effective were, first of all, it was different. Secondly, there was no distraction. There were no menus, no graphics, no other things to click on. There was just the one centralized message that led you to an inevitable conclusion, which was either buy this or don't. <laughs> and so it was very few choices to make, just one or the other. And it worked really, really well. Now, that, like anything else that works well, became overused and overdone and got filled with people who started using the techniques of manipulation to try and supercharge their sales letters. And it quickly developed the stigma of being a really hypey, sleazy kind of way to sell things online. In fact, people, when they just saw something that had the appearance of one of those sales letters and they became known for having lots of big red headlines and marked up with fake marker and highlighter, and which is ridiculous because nobody can highlight the internet. <laughs> um, but it worked anyway. It, it, felt, it gave those letters a human touch. So that's how it all got started. And people began to refer to 
the page on your website that sells your product or service as your sales letter or your sales copy. And so now some people still use that approach. And the only people upon whom that works are people who are in that industry who've been taught almost like a catechism that this is the way you must sell things online if you know what you're doing. And so they will only buy from other people who use those kind of scammy looking sales letters. So it's sort of a small insulated bubble in the world of marketing on the internet. But for everybody else, uh, we've evolved into a much more um, user-friendly, um, client-focused way of communicating. Mm. And the good parts of sales letters, the parts that are helpful to us, still work as well as ever. And the reason that they're so long, there's so much copy, is very simple. If you are considering a purchase of a training program or uh, a nutritional supplement or a book or anything else, and it's a significant decision for you, and for some people, that might mean a decision for a $30 book. Mm. For other people, it might mean it's not significant until it's something that's $1,000 or more. But whatever's significant for you, the more information you have, the easier it is for you to make a decision. And so sales copy is often longer than we might be comfortable with because we have to answer every question that people might come up with. And we have no idea which ones they may ask, and which ones they may not. So we have to answer them all in the copy. And that's why they tend to be longer. But the good news is, they don't have to be 50 pages long. I'm actually in the process of, of writing uh, what I would consider to be my first official sales letter and have gotten stuck a number of times <laughs> in the process. And so uh, being able to read uh, your book and particularly that section has, has been uh, very, very helpful. And, and, and one of the things I like about it is it's, it's a reference guide. I mean, this will be a book you refer to again and again and again as you dive into these things. And I, I don't believe that I'll ever write another blog post title or an email subject line, for example, without first referring back to another one of the chapters in the book, chapter three. Uh, Ray, what are the most important things we should keep in mind when developing our email subject lines or, or our blog posts? Well, that's a great question because the headline is the most important piece of copy you will write. It's all important, but if you don't get the headline right, nobody's going to read the rest of it. So <laughs> it doesn't matter how good the rest of it is. And uh, John Caples, who is one of the great pioneers of the direct response marketing industry, said once, if you can come up with a good headline and lead, that's the beginning of your sales copy, you are almost sure to have a good ad, but even the greatest copywriter can't save an ad with a poor headline. And so just substitute in blog post or sales copy page or whatever you're writing mm. um, for ad and you get how important it is. And there, I believe there are five essential qualities of a compelling headline. And, and there's probably more, but these are the five that I believe are most important. And number one is it grabs attention. So that's the number one job is to just get the reader's attention mm. and it has to either make a claim or a promise or evoke an emotional response or stir up curiosity. And ideally it would do all three. So an example of this would be, uh, this is, this, this is just a riff on a classic headline that was originally written by the way, by John Caples. Mm. And this is, this headline is which of these five mistakes do you make on your blog? Well, that grabs attention because it makes me think, am I making this mistake on my blog? <laughs> and what are these mistakes? And am I making all five of them or just one of them? Or um, I have to know. And so that clearly does the job. Um, the second essential quality of a compelling headline is that it screens and qualifies your readers. So this is where it becomes important to pick words and language that your tribe that you're trying to reach automatically identifies and realizes that you are one of them. So, um, if you're writing to tech oriented kind of people who are also entrepreneurs, then a headline like this, the top 10 iPad apps for entrepreneurs, that may not sound super compelling to somebody outside this group of readers, but they're entrepreneurs, they're tech oriented apps are a big part of their life as anybody who has an iPad knows. And so that's a great headline that helps qualify and screen your readers. The third uh, essential quality of a compelling headline is that it draws readers into the body copy. It makes them want to read more. The fourth quality is that it communicates the big idea when at all possible. So there should be just one big idea to your sales copy. It should let people know what the one true benefit of your post is. If it's a blog post or of your podcast, if it's that, or if you're selling, then what's the one true benefit outcome result of your product. And then the fifth quality of a compelling headline is that it establishes credibility. And you can't always use all five of these in a single headline, but you should 
strive to get at least three of them, if at all possible. And so if you have an authority card that you can play, I would play it. So it might be something like PhD psychologist reveals the secret of self-discipline. Well, that's immediate credibility because a PhD psychologist must know more than I know about self-discipline. Another example would be Harvard study shows three common traits of successful people. Harvard immediately carries a lot of credibility in people's minds. So they're apt to give more attention to something that starts with that particular headline than if you left out the name Harvard. So those are just five qualities that I think make headlines more compelling. Uh, Ray, regarding email, uh, why is it in 2016 that that email still works? I mean, I've worked for my share of, of companies that you know, email was nothing but a mechanism for broadcasting you know, announcements of what we're doing. There wasn't a whole lot of relationship building uh, going on. So, so for those who are doing it right, uh, why is it that email still works? <laughs> well, it's a good question because so many people have pronounced – the death of email. Right. That I feel tempted to resurrect uh, Mark Twain's old quotation and say that the death of email has been greatly exaggerated because <laughs> um, it's not dead. Because think about if you've been awake more than an hour while you're listening to this show, then you've probably already checked your email mm. and you probably didn't do it. So you could get one of those uh, 50% off coupons from Kohl's. Uh, you probably <laughs> checked to see if there was a message from your boss or from your girlfriend or your boyfriend or you're somebody in your family or just a friend, mm. maybe something funny that somebody wanted to send along to you. The reason it still works, Jeff, is because it is a personal medium and it is the, at this point, still the number one medium of communication that we use the internet for. Now there's, there's a, a big wave of communication through things like Facebook messenger and through chat and text messages. But email is the one medium that is nearly universal and it gives you an opportunity to sell in a way that doesn't feel pushy or salesy. So if you can pay attention to what it feels like to get an email from a friend and you can write your emails like that to your customers mm. instead of making it look like a magazine ad, mm. uh, that still works. Well, Ray says it's possible to uh, write your offer so irresistibly that the product sells itself. What makes a, an offer irresistible in, in your view? Well, and this is... Um, this is something that we've all experienced because we've all been in a situation where we just saw a product or a service and we felt like we instantly knew that we needed to buy it. We had to buy it. Maybe we didn't even need to buy it. We just wanted to buy it. So what makes an irresistible offer? It's something that's so appealing that it sells itself and you don't ask people to buy, they ask you. And so let's start with what makes up an offer. Um, the offer is at the core of your sales copy. It's the benefit of what you're selling. So the transformation that it offers, it's also the vehicle or the mechanism that delivers the transformation. And it's also the price and the payment terms. Mm -hmm. So that's a very mechanical definition that doesn't really answer your question, but I think we need to start with knowing exactly what we mean by offer. Yeah. Yeah. So what makes it irresistible? It's the way in which you present the offer and You've got to present one of those core elements of an offer in such a way that it starts to feel magnetic and pulls people toward saying yes. So it might be the benefit of what you're selling. I think that's what makes the P90X offer so irresistible because we see these people on television going from really fat and sloppy looking to being really trim and athletic and sculpted. And we, <laughs> we think, I, I, I want to look like that. And if you notice, if you pay attention to that infomercial, uh, you'll notice that they have all different kinds of people. They have short people, tall people. Um, they have men, women. They have all the different basic body types, and they show the transformation for each from before to after. The reason is they're trying to show you the benefit, the transformation for your specific body type and, and kind of person. So you can look and say, well, that guy's just like me, and look how he looks now. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one way to make the offer compelling is to emphasize the benefit. The other way to make it compelling is to focus on or make the vehicle or mechanism that delivers it, make that irresistible. There are some people for whom a book will never do the trick. I, I know that's shocking for you and me. We can't believe that. <laughs> like clearly the book is the best way to deliver information. Uh, but for some people, that's not true. For some people it's video. Some people it's a live in-person experience. So you have to know your audience well enough to know that. And then the third way is the price and the payment terms. 
And a good example of this is, especially if you can find a way to make a payment term offer that is completely irresistible. And I'll, I'll give you an example from personal experience. There's a good friend of mine who, at the time that this happened, I didn't even know this guy. Mm. But his name is uh, Kurt Christensen. And he was selling a marketing product. It was, this will tell you how long ago this was. It was cassette tapes. <laughs> and um, he sent me an email that said, I need your shipping address. Now, I had never heard of these cassette tapes before. I didn't know this product existed, but I was curious about the subject line of this email that said, I need your shipping address. So I read the email and it said, I'd like to send you this set of cassette tapes about marketing that I normally charge $500 for. Mm -hmm. And if you will just send me your shipping address and $20 to pay the shipping, I will send you the whole set of tapes and you can listen to them. And if you like them, then keep them and I'll bill you for the balance of the $495 or whatever it was. And if you don't like them, just send them back and you won't owe me any more money. And I thought I'd be stupid to say no to that offer. <laughs> so I ordered, I sent the 20 bucks. I ordered the cassettes and um, I didn't listen to them. And the last day I realized I'd marked on my calendar, you need to either keep the tapes or send them back. And it was really too late to send them back because I couldn't get them back in time. So um, I kept them and I listened to them after that more than once. They were fantastic, but mm. the, the actual vehicle of the payment terms was what was irresistible to me. So there's mm. different ways to approach it. And in the book, I give nine kinds of offers, different ways you can approach making the offer, but it really centers around focusing on one of those three elements. Well, I want you to kind of uh, spend some time too, Ray, if you would, talking about the difference between uh, selling people what they want and, and selling them what they need. This is a nuance, I think, that is missed by, by a lot of, of marketers. <laughs> well, and it's funny because you can always tell who's going to be selling people what they need because they'll tell you that. Well, everybody <laughs> needs my product. <laughs> they should have it. Mm. Um, but if you can't find a way to make them want what you're offering, uh, you're not going to have very much success at selling it. So um, often what people want is different from what they need. So what they want, for instance, to you go back to the P90X example, is they want the sculpted body with the six-pack abs and the well-defined muscles and um, the lithe frame. But what they need is to work their tail off in the gym and stop eating so much garbage. Hmm. Uh, but you can't sell people, work your tail off in the gym and stop eating so much garbage. <laughs> that does not sell well. <laughs> um, but what you can do is you can show them what they want and you can show it to them so vividly and so beautifully, and you can promise to deliver it, and you can actually can deliver it. And underneath all that is the fact that the way you're delivering it is with what they need. And I often uh, equate this to um, the, uh, I call it pill pocket selling. Mm. And uh, pill pockets, if you have a dog or a cat, you already know what these are. They're these little globs of gelatinous goo <laughs> that you put vitamin pills or medicine in so that your pet will eat it. Because if you ever tried to give a, a dog a pill, you know that what happens is they put it in their mouth, they smack their lips a little bit. <laughs> they have lips. I don't know if they do. <laughs> and then they spit the pill out because it tastes bad. Mm. And if you put it inside a pill pocket, however, they will gobble it up. It'll never even touch their tongue. It just, it's gone. Mm. So you're giving the dog what the dog needs, but it's wrapped in something that they want. And I'm not comparing people to dogs, but I am saying that the psychology that we often employ is very similar. We, there are things that we need. We need to not smoke. We need to exercise. We need to eat better. We need to save money. We need to get out of debt. We need to invest for the future. And what we want is immediate gratification right now. <laughs> and so, I mean, like Dave Ramsey is a guy who does a great job of giving people what they need but he wraps it in a very real authentic package of what they want. What they want is freedom from debt collectors and the pressures of finances on their marriage and so forth. And so he just, he shows them the benefits of what they want and projects that image so perfectly that they're willing to do and receive what they need in order to get there. I just love any opportunity. I get to say the words gelatinous goo. <laughs> well, and that is the sign of a true word lover. <laughs> Well, Ray and I run in some of the same circles and know a lot of the same folks, people like Mike Kim and uh, Carrie Oberbrunner, Dan Miller, Michael Hyatt, Grant Baldwin. And it seems like every time I turn around, uh, somebody's launching a new product or service, and many of them uh, seem to be employing some of, of your techniques, Ray, because they're often very well done and effective. Um, share a bit about the nuances 
of writing good product launch copy? Well, a product launch, um, it may seem obvious what that is. Most people think it just means, well, you're just for the first time offering a product to the public. But really, it's more than that. It is the conscious engineered process of rolling a product out in such a way that people have more desire for it than they would if you just simply made a flat announcement. And, you know, Steve Jobs was the master of this. It became to be expected every year at Apple's annual announcements that he would reach the end of his presentation and he almost as if he was going to walk off the stage and then he would stop and turn around and say, oh, one more thing. And then out would come the new iPhone or the new iPad or what people were actually there to hear about all the time. <laughs> and, you know, the audience would erupt because this is what they were waiting for. So he launched these products by building anticipation over time. And so for a full treatment of how to do a launch, I would really recommend a book called Launch by Jeff Walker. Mm. Uh, it's a really fun, comprehensive guide to how to do this online. And Jeff really pioneered the process of the consciously devised product launch sequences online. So it's a great book. You should probably read it. I will tell you that I think what makes launches uh, really effective are two things. First of all, they use psychological triggers and you can learn more about this. You know that I'm going to recommend a bunch of books, Jeff, right? <laughs> um, you can learn more about this uh, in Dr. Robert Cialdini's book, Influence. And this, I love this book because it was a, it's the result of university peer reviewed work and studies uh, and not just armchair psychologizing, but actual science. And Dr. Cialdini identified these triggers that influence us to do the things that we want to do. And I won't go into how they all work, but I'll tell you what they are. They're reciprocity, commitment and consistency, liking, authority, social proof, and scarcity. And you really should read the book. It's a short read. And the irony is, of course, he wrote this book, I think, so that people could guard themselves against these techniques being used on them to get them to do things. Mm -hmm. And marketers immediately took it as, well, oh, this is a handbook about how to do this, <laughs> um, which I think is fine, but you just need to be coming from the right place in your heart about doing this. You need to, to be motivated by helping people, not by manipulating people, as we talked about earlier. So part one is the psychological triggers of why these product launches work. Part two is... Um, story and value. There's no better way to influence people than by telling them a good story. A good story will trump good logic every single time. And just look back in history at people who changed the world. Dr. Martin Luther King told great stories and he changed the world. Nobody can argue that. John F. Kennedy told a great story and he changed the world. I mean, he's the, people forget how incredible it was that he said, we choose to go to the moon. The technology to do that did not exist. <laughs> it was impossible when he said that. Mm. And then he told the story of how this is, he said, this is who we are as a people. We don't do the easy things. We choose the hard things because they're hard. Mm. Now that was a story he was telling people about themselves that gave them the vision to go for something that was impossible. And guess what happened? We went to the moon and that just gives me chills every time I think about it. Jesus you know, go back and, and read in the Bible how many um, exegetical sermons Jesus gave when he spoke to people. Not very many. He told stories. So whether you're a person who follows Jesus or not, you can appreciate that he told these stories that to this day we still talk about. And so storytelling and value, that's the third element of effective product launches. Mm -hmm. Giving actual value before you ask anybody to buy something from you. Because that is a demonstration of generosity, and it's also proof that you have things that are worth paying for. Well, uh, speaking of story, toward the end of the book, uh, Ray mentions that many secrets to writing great copy can be learned from watching movies. Does that take us back to story uh, primarily, Ray, or are there other elements uh, from watching films that, that, that we, can, we can draw from? Well, it's both. I mean, it does take us back to stories, but the reason for that chapter... Um, is because of the, the specific storytelling tactics that are employed in actual movie trailers um, mm. because they, they tell the story in such a way that it compels you to want to watch the movie. So I look at movie trailers as like the most condensed example of the great art form of mm. telling a great story that you can find anywhere. And um, sometimes it's 
to the detriment of the people who make the movie because they set the bar so high with the trailer that when you go see the film, you're like, well, all the best parts were in the trailer. <laughs> um, so you have to be careful how you do that. But as I was researching this chapter, I found this quote that I love from a Hopi Native American tradition. And it says, those who tell the stories rule the world. And th this really is the truth. I mean, we, we've all heard about the hero's journey, which is a, a form of storytelling that was uh, defined by Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you read his work or you read uh, Robert McKee's book story and his thoughts on how to tell stories and how to write good movies, there's a universal structure behind these stories that we find appealing. And if you study it long enough, uh, it just changes the way you watch TV and movies. It's like you can sit with somebody who doesn't know and you can tell them what's going to happen 10 minutes ahead of time. <laughs> you can say, well, this character is the uh, antagonist and he will die in the next scene. And uh, don't do that because it really, it puts a damper on the amount of friendliness this person feels toward you whenever you're <laughs> watching a movie together. But uh, story is so important. And uh, this, this last chapter of the book that you're referring to, how the secrets of writing blockbuster copy by watching movies really goes through what I call the principle of the dynamic uh, or dominant story idea and how you can use that to give people a sample of the feelings they will get from the story that you're going to be telling them or the movie they're going to be watching and how you present proof that the movie works. And these three elements, they may not sound like you can use them as marketing clues, but you can. You can I, and I give an example of how you can actually take the elements of a good movie trailer and turn them into good product copy that will sell your services or your products. Or if you're not selling services or products, you're probably selling ideas or a point of view or a cause. And it's still selling. It's still the same psychology, whether money is changing hands or not. Well, as you can probably tell, Ray is gifted in not only written communication, but in conversation as well, because I, I can't, uh, I, I'm hard pressed to think of, of, of a guest I've had on the show, and I'm not just saying this to blow smoke, who can articulate their ideas and their thoughts so succinctly and eloquently and as easy to understand as you do. So, so thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, I have a couple of questions that uh, I want to ask you, Ray, that aren't directly tied to the book. Uh, but before I do that, I know we've skipped around a little bit. Is there anything else from the book that you want to make sure that we that we walk away with? Yes, I would simply say that whether you read my book or it's someone else's book on copywriting or really it's persuasive communication. I mean, copywriting is a way for me to dress up persuasive communication in clothes that a certain group of people will welcome into their office. And that doesn't mean that the principles are any different from being persuasive in the rest of your life. And I think that if we could all learn how to be ethically persuasive, most of the problems we experience in the world would vanish because we'd be better communicators. We'd be communicating with the benefit of the other person in mind, and we would never be willing to make a sale at the expense of another person. Mm, that, that is powerful. <laughs> that, that puts a nice bow on it. I really like that. Thank you. And you've mentioned a number of books already, and I, uh, as you know, can never get uh, too many <laughs> to read. I'm reading six or seven at any one time. Uh, I, I want to know, uh, if, if you haven't already shared them, what are those books, those one or two, that you keep going back to again and again, those, those tried and true tomes that, uh, that you, you pick up over and over? Oh, absolutely. I would love to share those. Um, so I'll give you three, and before that, I'll give you a, a, a preemptive tome, and that is the Bible. <laughs> Uh, to me, the Bible is inexhaustible mm. in the wisdom and life that it can give. Just, I, I've been reading it ever since I could read. <laughs> and, yeah, I never seem to be able to exhaust it. It seems like it's a new book every time I go to it. Mm. So that's my, that's my number one. Um, beyond that, there are three books that uh, probably might be surprising in the context of the book that I've been talking about because mm. they're so different. But they are, uh, first, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Mm. I have read that book uh, probably a dozen times. Anytime I get stuck uh, creatively or I begin to feel frustrated by the getting bogged down in the details of my work, mm. um, this book really wakes me up and brings me out of that space because it's all about something that Pressfield calls the resistance, which is that thing that props up inside of us that wants to stop us from doing the work that we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I highly recommend it to anybody who's creative, which is anybody. Just let me, <laughs> let me go ahead and tell you the secret. You're creative. <laughs> um, the second book, and I've only read this book three times, but 
it has had such a profound influence on my life. Uh, it's The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, I just love that book. It is so supremely powerful. And there's a quote from the book that um, I have right in front of me. In fact, it's, it says, "To realize one's destiny is a person's only obligation." And that book is, it's, and guess what? It's a story. <laughs> it's, it's quote, just a story. Um, and then the third book I would recommend, especially for those who are in the world of business and marketing, even if you're marketing ideas only, would be Tribes by Seth Godin. Mm. I've read that book, again, probably a dozen times, and I just go back to it, and it's just, uh, again, it's another book that I feel is inexhaustible. One of my favorite authors, uh, for sure. And, and Seth was responsible for helping return to me uh, my love for reading and, and is a big reason why this show exists. I was exposed to his work uh, for the first time back in 2003 and, and about a decade prior to that, I'd come out of college with the attitude Ray that was like, Oh great. I don't have to learn anymore. Thank oh. goodness. I don't have to read anymore. I'm, that part of my life is over. That was my attitude as a young man. And that's what college does to people. It does. It really does oftentimes. Uh, but then in my early thirties, I had a great leader, at the company I was working for who introduced me to, uh, people like Seth and and um, Jim Collins and Pat Lencioni and, and folks of of that uh, ilk, and uh, I uh, I fell in love with it all over again, and I've 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 been reading a, a, a book a week ever since. I think <laughs> you know uh, that's such a beautiful story, and I have a I have a story about Seth that will show you the impact he's had. I mean, this is just the impact he's had on my life, mm-hmm. and he's had this kind of impact I think on millions of people, but. Uh, back when he was not as well known as he is today, he had a workshop in his offices in New York and, uh, or just outside of New York. And I paid, I think it was $1,200 to go to this, um, one day event mm. at Seth Godin's offices. And there were half a dozen people there, something like that. I don't remember exactly how many people, but I was in the radio business at the time. And I was asking Seth questions about the radio business and about how to make our stations better and how to make, help them make more money and apply his principles and ideas to that business. And the question I asked him first was, Seth, if you were in the radio broadcasting business, as I am, what would your advice be about what to do now in today's environment? And this was just at the early beginnings of the World Wide Web. Mm. And he looked at me for a moment and he said, Ray, I would be thinking about what I was going to be doing when I was out of the radio business. <laughs> and to this day, I, I feel that kind of punch to the gut. I felt I said that, but it was a good punch to the gut because it really woke me up. And that's the reason why I was thinking far enough ahead that I was able to transition out of that business into the business that I'm in now. And I was able to be so successful because I got ahead of the curve. He saw something coming that other people did not see. And thank goodness he shared that vision with me. And that was all empowered through his books and his writing. Well, uh, I know you don't do a lot of public speaking. You're very selective about the ones that you take on, though I haven't had a chance to see you or hear you speak publicly in that kind of a setting. I've heard wonderful things from those who have, and I would be curious to know, Ray, what you think of when you're thinking about giving a public talk. What are your tips for making sure it's impactful and that it's memorable? Well, this is something that I give a lot of thought to. I really enjoy speaking publicly. And I was introduced to an idea by Ken Davis that really revolutionized the way I think about speaking in public. And that is simply, um, well, he tells this story about how um, there was a, I don't know who did the study or the research, but this is what I, this is my probably messed up version of Ken's great story. Um, there, this study was done of a large group of people and there was a, uh, several speakers that were coming off stage after they had given their talks and they asked the audience, how did you like the talk? And the response was, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It was, it was great. And they asked them then, and what was it about? (laughs) And only about half the people could answer the question Mm -hmm. succinctly. Like, well, it was about the following subject, but what was more shocking was they also talked to the speakers and they said, how did you think the talk went? And, Almost inevitably, they said it was was great. It went fantastic. And just in one sentence, what would you say your talk was about? And a larger percentage, it seems like it was like 70 or 80% of them, could not express in a single sentence what their talk was about. (laughs) And that was one of those buckets of cold water over my head Mm. moments because I realized, oh, I would have been one of those guys. 
And so Ken has a, a whole system that he teaches. And oddly enough, there's a book about it. It's called Secrets <laughs> of Dynamic Communications. Um, you can get it on Amazon. There's two versions of it, by the way. I would urge you to get the one that was published in 2013. Um, and he spells out his system of giving a talk. And the first step is defining what are you trying to accomplish with this talk? What is your objective? And he really walks you through a process of getting that down to a single solitary sentence. And when you have that objective statement about what your talk is about or about what your book is about, I mean, this has really affected not only how I speak in public, but how I write. For instance, my book, How to Write Copy That Sells, the objective statement that I had in mind as I was writing that book was, anyone can learn a system for how to make more sales to more customers more often by applying the lessons in this book. Mm. That was my objective statement for the book. And anybody who's read Ken's book or taken his SCORE training, that's S-C-O-R-R-E, anybody who's done either of those things will be smiling now because they'll recognize the format of that objective mm. statement. Uh, but that is, is like a compass that keeps me pointed towards true north. So when I speak in public, I know the one thing that I'm trying to accomplish with that talk. And then I develop a rationale that makes that one thing happen. And I do it in such a way that hopefully a majority of the people, if you surveyed them as they went out the door, would be able to say, oh, yes, I love to talk. And here's what it was about. It was about how I can write copy that helps me make more sales to more customers more often by using Ray's system. I had a chance to talk to him about that book, about the 2013 version uh, back when it came out. So I'll link to that in the show notes as well, because that's a very valuable uh, resource uh, to dig into for sure. Well, uh, Ray, what's uh, coming up next for you, if you know? Uh, what are you working on now with your team that, that uh, you're really excited about? Well, as we record this, um, I, of course, I've got my book in release. So that's the thing that I'm focused on right now. And then the next thing is a course that is a a more extensive dive into how do you do the things that are in the book. For many people, the book in itself will be enough. It'll be what they need. Mm -hmm. And then for other people who want to take it further, we have this course that's going to be available that will allow them to go deeper and get more personal attention and instruction from me. And then after that, as you might guess, I already have another book I'm working on. But <laughs> um, as, a, as the wise philosopher Yoda once said, <laughs> this one, always his mind to the future, never on where he is and what he's doing. So I'm I'm working to focus on what I'm doing right now, which is this book and the course that goes with it. And in the background, I'm working on the other book. Mm. Is there a, um, is it too early to, to, to share a launch date for that course? Um, no, it's not too early. Um, <laughs> thank you for asking. Uh, it will be on the first, actually not the first of April, but the 31st of March, March because okay. I refused to start the course on <laughs> April Fool's Day. <laughs> I totally understand that. <laughs> well, uh, Ray, it's been a treat uh, to have you here. Thank you for helping us dive deeper into the book and, and and learning about this process. I think, again, it's very helpful for for those of us trying to, to make a difference. So thank you. Well, thank you. You're very kind. Ray is definitely somebody you should take the opportunity to get to know. And a great way to do that is uh, via Twitter. You can follow him there at Ray Edwards. That's at Ray Edwards on Twitter. If you're not able to get online right now, just remember this URL, readtoleadpodcast.com slash 119 for episode 119. There you'll find all the links and resources Ray and I talked about. Of course, the link to his website, rayedwards.com, as well as links to all the books he recommended. And speaking of books, now at 119 episodes in, we've amassed a number of them. Uh, featuring not only those from each of our guests, of course, but also the many, many books they've recommended. Finding a complete list of those on our website up till now was not possible. But thanks to a listener who all called Jonathan, his last name, I'm not exactly sure to pronounce, so I'll have to follow up with him on that. He has taken every book featured on every episode and every book recommended by every guest and compiled it in a nice, concise spreadsheet. I plan to add that to our website very, very soon. So you'll have a, a very simplified way of browsing every book we've ever talked about or recommended here on the show. And finally, I want to mention the wonderful rating and review we received recently from Gonzalez L. in iTunes, who gives it five stars and says, I play each episode twice. I appreciated his written review as well. I don't normally share these, but I'd like to share this one. 
Gonzalez L. says, I get so much value out of each and every episode. The podcast has been so inspiring that I now have a new outlook on life and entrepreneurship. Not only has it inspired me, but my fiance was inspired to start a blog and eventually a podcast. Thank you, Jeff, for this podcast. It's become a vital part of my daily routine. You have no idea how encouraging that is. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. Of course, you can leave a rating and review as well in iTunes at readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. Or if Stitcher is your app of choice, simply go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash Stitcher. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.